Well, let's turn to God's word, shall we? Luke chapter 17 is where we continue this morning. In verse 3, with a sermon titled, Resolving Sin God's Way, Repent. Repentance. What are the two most difficult words for a person to say? I'm sorry. Many of you knew that. You're mouthing it as I was asking the question. It's difficult for adults to say. It's difficult for children to say. Which is why when children get into trouble, especially in the home, they do something they shouldn't do to their brother or sister, mom and dad. Look at them with that special look that says, you better say you're sorry. And if they don't, the intensity ramps up. Say it, and you better mean it, right? Because we know the importance of saying sorry and what it communicates. But why is it so difficult to say just those two words? They're not complicated. But it takes great humility because of the sin that dwells within us, because of the pride that consumes our heart. It, it takes a lot of humility to acknowledge that I have done something wrong, that I have caused this situation, that I have caused hurt and harm and offense to all who are involved. But this has been a difficult admission since the first man and woman began. Go back to the very first sin of Genesis 3. What was Adam's response to his sin when God confronted him? Adam, what'd you do? And Adam said, it was the woman you gave me, God. The very first response to the very first sin was to shift the blame to someone else. Because as soon as sin entered the picture, pride was with it. And pride continues to devastate conflict and sin in the midst of our relationships. And this is why there's so much hurt, pain, and conflict in the world and this is also why there can be so much hurt, pain, and conflict in the church as well. Because of a lack of humility. A lack of understanding God's means and methods of dealing with sin. We began two weeks ago to look at this in Luke chapter 17 with the first two verses talking about the inevitability of sin. We live in a sinful, dark world. You will step into sin. People in the world will lead you and entice you and throw hurdles your way to cause you to stumble but Jesus said it better not come from within the own body of Christ. It better not be that you cause a brother or sister to stumble into sin. You better not make any offense to a brother or sister in Christ. Because sin is most severe to our God. And so the exhortation two weeks ago was to not give any offense. Then we walked into the beginning of verse 3 last week with an exhortation to not take any offense. But if sin has taken place, instead of attacking the individual through a sinful response, or running away, escaping from the individual or situation through a likewise sinful response, Jesus gave us a better way. A way to resolve sin God's way through rebuke. We saw that last week. Biblical rebuke. We saw first, the first step in biblical rebuke from Matthew 7 is to confront yourself. To examine yourself, to see the log that exists in your own eye before you engage in a speck in your brother or sister's eye. And so self-evaluation, self-examination is very difficult, again, because of our pride, because of our sin, deception within. I gave you the pause principle. That how do you think through, self-evaluate and examine your own heart? You pray for God's help. You ask clarifying questions of the situation. You understand the situation through a biblical lens. You submit to the scripture, even in your responses, and then you express a biblical response in the situation. And as we worked through that last week, we found out that many times, not all the time, but many times, the most biblical response is not to respond at all. Because there are lots of other reasons why we get hurt when offenses come. It's not just blatant sin when it's done, but it's when we have wrongful expectations that we've placed on somebody else and those expectations get broken, then I'm hurt by it, but those are far and above scripture. Preferences that I've set for relationships, when those preferences are met, I'm, I'm hurt by that. But they didn't sin against me in that way. These are blatant sins that we're talking about. All others we overlook in love. 
But if it is blatant sin, you confront them alone. Matthew 18 tells us that. And you confront them in love. Galatians 6.1. With gentleness. Seeking what? What is the goal of biblical rebuke? Well, it's biblical repentance. And that's what we look at next in the text. And God's ways of resolving sin, first comes rebuke, then comes repentance. Look at Luke 17.3. He says, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Now, we talk quite a bit about repentance here in the church, and rightfully so, but how do you know if someone's truly repentant? Is it because they're sad or sorrowful? Is it because they have remorse over what they've done? Is it because they are self-condemning or self-loathing of what they've done? Is it because they have this sort of external reformation happening? They're, They're saying different things, treating me differently. Is that what true repentance looks like? Well, these are not marks of repentance by themselves, because each one of those can be done with wrong motives from a sinful, selfish, self-preserving, self-protecting heart. I mean, people can be sad and sorrowful of something they've done, but because it now adds consequences to their life. People can regret what they've done. They can self-condemn and self-loathe because now they have consequences they have to pay for their actions. People can change the way that they live outwardly in a shallow manner because they're trying to minimize any sort of pain that will come in the future. Again, all of these can come and stem from motivations that are intended to minimize the pain to themselves, minimize the damage to themselves. It is all in the name of self-preservation and self-protection. Damage control, nothing more. So we need to understand from the scriptures themselves what biblical repentance truly is. And just like we did last week, we'll use Luke 17.3 as our master plan blueprints and then use that model as we dive into other parallel texts of Scripture to fill out the details of what exactly this looks like in the Christian life. And so as we look at biblical repentance this morning, I'm going to define it as the inner reorientation of turning away from sin and turning towards God in holiness. It's an inner humility which moves towards outer change. And so in order to best study this morning, provide a comprehensive manner of biblical repentance in the time that we have here, we'll have repentance under two headings this morning for our purposes. The first, we'll look at the meaning of repentance according to Scripture. And then secondly, we'll look at the marks of repentance. So first, let's consider the meaning of repentance by looking at the very word itself and the words most closely associated with it. And when we come to the Bible, there are three words which really rise above the rest, which communicate the principle of what repentance is. These are Greek words, metanoia, which is the word repentance that we know. The Greek word metamelomai, which is remorse or regret. And then the word epistrepho, which is a turning. Now, just like in any other language, it's not just one word that can describe what something is. In the English language, if I want to describe somebody as fast, I can also say they're quick, they're speedy, they're fast. Three words, same principle. In Espanol, I can say feliz. I can say contento or alegre to all describe happy. Accurate? Yes? Okay. My sources didn't lead me astray. (laughs) So just like in those languages, the Greek language is similar. There are three words that jump to the surface that really show us a threefold progression of repentance as reflected throughout Scripture. This begins with a change of thinking, then moves to a change of feeling, then results in a change of living. Let's see this for ourselves. First, the meaning of repentance is a change of thinking, a change of the mind. First term I gave you, metanoia, is that word repentance that we are used to seeing and hearing. It means a change of mind or a change of the inner man, the inner person. It comes from the prefix meta, meaning to change, and then noia, meaning a mind or thought or reasoning or attitude or understanding. And you see, the mind, according to ancient Greeks, was far more than simply a person's intellect or ideas. 
It was descriptive of the totality of their inner being and inner person. It refers to the sum total of the moral state of being of a person. We see this word used in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, which Paul writes, For godly sorrow produces repentance, metanoia, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So first we understand in the first progression of what repentance truly is, is that godly sorrow over sin produces a change of mindset about the sin. You begin to see your sin differently than you did before. I mean, think of it, when you're tempted to sin, it doesn't present itself as stepping into a death trap of suicide, does it? No. It presents itself as, this won't be that big of a deal. People won't know what you're going to do. There are other sins that are worse than that. It's minimizing the consequences of it. That's how you see the sin. You don't see it as a big deal. That's why you step into it. That's why you commit the sin, whether you say, you think, you do, whatever it might be. And so when you're convicted by the Spirit, the first thing that happens is you see this sin differently now than you used to. Think of it in a manner, it's like changing your prescription when you go to the eye doctor. As you get older, your eyes start to get a little blurry and fuzzy. You start to lose the details, and the details matter. So you go and you swap out the prescription. You get new lenses prescribed to you, whether contacts or glasses. And now you can see with vivid clarity the details that you were formerly missing. And the details paint a completely different picture than just general sight. You see... We see sin in general as bad. But sometimes you can miss the individual details of specific sins and why they're heinous. And that's why you give in to temptation. But when conviction comes by the Spirit of God, the first thing that changes is your sight. Spiritual sight, mental thinking, and how you process this situation. That's what this first word communicates. The inner being and how it sees sin, thinks about sin. But it doesn't stop there. It moves to the emotions. We first have a change of thinking, then a change of feeling, of the desires, of the affections, of the emotions. The second term, metamelomai, means to remorse or regret. Meta change, mellow your care or your concern. It literally means changing what you care about, changing what you are concerned about. Before you cared about this sin and you wanted it, But then you see what devastation comes through it. The consequences. The harm it does in your relationship to God. What it does to Christ. And all of a sudden your care and concern changes. It's not about the sin anymore. You actually care about removing the sin. And you care and you're concerned about holiness and righteousness. We see this in Matthew 21, 28 through 29 gives the example, but do you think a man has two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. Verse 29, he answered and said, I will not, but afterwards he regretted it. Metamelomai. Regretted it. His care or concern changed based on what he said to his father. So then he went to go work. But keep in mind what I said at the outset. Not any one of these by themselves is biblical repentance. Because remorse or regret by itself does not equate a broken spirit. Humble to change. Matthew 27, 3. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful, metamelomai, and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Judas felt remorse. He saw that what he did in selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver was, was wrong. His mindset changed in a way. He was regretting what he had done. But Judas truly wasn't repentant. How do we know? Because what came from that repentance? Suicide. The guilt never left him. The condemnation was too much. So he did what? He could to escape it. You see, a change of mind leads to a change in desires and affections and what you care about and are concerned about, but then it leads to a change of the will, of your volitional decision-making faculties of what you decide what to do or not to do. 
and regarding living in sin and holiness. Because if you leave repentance as just a change of mind and emotions, but never actually corresponds in fruits of changing how you live, has your mind and desires truly changed at all? I'll give you an example. Say you go to the doctor's office for a routine checkup. Doctor says, you need to lose some weight. You're at risk of a heart attack. And so you leave, shrug it off, keep eating what you're eating, not exercising, living the way that you want to, because you believe the same thing about your situation of your health as you went in. Your mind wasn't changed. Your desires didn't change. That's why your choices didn't change. But if you go into the doctor's office, and the doctor sits you down and says, look, you need to lose some weight. We need to put you on a diet. You need to reschedule some, alleviate some stress. And all of a sudden, you walk out of there. And you now go more for the salad than for the burger. You eliminate some of responsibilities extra at work to alleviate stress. You begin going to the gym, exercising. What's happening? Your mindset's changed. You see the situation differently now. And your cares and concerns about the situation are different now. And it corresponds directly with how you live. It's as simple as that. You see, a true change of mind that leads to a true change of desires will always be accompanied by a change of how you live. Not as the basis for your repentance, but as the fruits which come directly from the repentance being shown. So we've seen this progression of a change of thinking to a change of feeling, and it leads to, like I said, a change of living, a change of the will. This is the third term, epistrepho. This is a turning, a transformation that takes place. If I begin driving down the wrong side of the road, it's not a good thing, is it? If I recognize, oh, I'm going the wrong way. I don't want to go the wrong way but I never turn the car around. What does that indicate? I actually don't believe it's that wrong. So I'm going to keep going the same direction. It's a similar mindset when there's not a turning that takes place in biblical repentance. We see this turning and transformation in 1 Thessalonians 1.9, where it says, For they themselves declare to us concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Turned, epistrepho. What was the Thessalonian situation here? They were worshiping idols. So what did they do? They saw their sin of idol worship as wrong. Their thinking was changed. They were grieved by their sin of idol worship. There's a change of feeling and affections. And so then they turned to stop worshiping idols and instead to worship God. A change of living. Now we start to see some of these words come together in Acts 3, 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repent, metanoia. Be converted, epistrepho. Repent and turn. That's why you see it translated convert. Acts 26, 17 through 20 says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me, that they should repent, metanoia, turn to God, epistrepho, and do works befitting repentance. You see, if you just change your mind and your affections, but not your actions or conduct, you fail to demonstrate the fruits of repentance, biblically speaking. That's what Acts 26, 20 says. Repent, turn to God, and do works befitting, that are fitting of flowing from genuine repentance. Because these fruits, what are they? What are the fruits that Scripture talk about? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, a different way that we think, feel, and live. What do we call those? The fruits of the Christian? The fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit. It's the Spirit that is producing this grace of repentance within us, and it demonstrates itself through these fruits. Matthew 3, 7 through 10. 
But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Jesus says to the Pharisees and scribes, repent in order to enter into the kingdom of God. And he says what? Don't look to your heritage and ancestry back to Abraham. You actually need to demonstrate that you have fruits of conversion to begin with. Or else what? Verse 10. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Are fruits important? Yes. If fruits don't follow, the tree is cut down. For just As a tree is known by its fruit, so repentance is known by its changed ways. So now that we understand this meaning, biblically speaking, of repentance, it's a change of thinking, a change of feeling, a change of living. What does it truly look like? Yes, your mindset's different, your affections are altered, your your will and decision-making has been changed. But how does that translate into daily life? What does it look like in the heart of a Christian? What does it look like in a church that's repentant? Well, now we explore the marks of repentance. The marks of repentance. We have biblical accounts, biblical testimonies that have happened in the history of the church, preserved through the written word of God for our instruction of an individual who had a repentant heart in a church who had a repentant heart. Turn with me to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. First, We can look at an inward testimony of the heart. Psalm 51. I'm going to read this for us. A prayer of repentance to the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, after Nathan rebuked David. Do you see the process of Luke 17.3? God's ways of resolving sin, it hasn't changed from Old Testament to New. David was rebuked with the word of God, and now repentance comes from it. Verse 1, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Was that the mindset of David when he committed this sin? No. No. What's he demonstrating in verses 1 through 3? That his mindset, thoughts, and attitudes of sin has changed. Verse 4, he goes on. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirits. Not only do we see that his mindset and thinking inside has changed about his sin, but we see that his feelings and emotions and desires have changed as well. How do we see that? How do you see someone's desires? Look at what they ask for. What are the petitions that David is making here? Because that's expressing the true desires of his heart. Verse 7, he wants to be purged of this sin. Wash me, give me joy and gladness. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God. A renewed, steadfast spirit restored to me the joy of my salvation. That is very different desires than when he was in this sin. When he was in this sin, 
his bones were wasting away, rotting like cancer within him, breaking him. He alludes to that in verse 8, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. But he goes on in verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways. Interesting. David was the transgressor. He's the one who committed the sin. So he's going from being a transgressor now to teaching transgressors your ways. That's called a turn, changing, transformation. And sinners will be converted to you. Verse 14, deliver me from the blood shed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not desire in burnt offerings. Look at verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. You want a one-verse summary of repentance. That's it. You're broken before your God. Crushed beneath his holiness, weighed down by what you've done to him. Twice in verse 17, it's broken, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, a heart of humility and surrender because of what you've done against your God. See, Psalm 51, it's like a keyhole that we see into the heart of David, who, by the way, is a man after God's own heart. That's significant. And so we see this internal testimony of what repentance looks like. But not only that, Scripture also has for us not just internal testimony, but an outward testimony as well. We've seen the first person viewpoint from the heart of David, but now we can step back and look at a whole repentant church and how they are repentant before God. Well, for that, we turn to 2 Corinthians 7. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 7. It's important for you to see these words. Second Corinthians 7, verses 9 through 12. I'll read it for us and walk us through it. It says, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Verse 11, for observe, look, see this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindications, and all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. What's Paul saying? What's the situation here? Paul's rebuked them. Luke 17.3. First step, resolving sin, God's way to, to rebuke them. What was the rebuke? The letter of 1 Corinthians was pretty much all rebuke. But at the heart of it was 1 Corinthians chapter 5 was a blatant, egregious, public sin that was being allowed and tolerated in the Corinthian church. And they were approaching it in a casual manner. Their hearts were callous. They saw it as normal. They didn't see any issue with it. So what did Paul do in writing 1 Corinthians to them? He rebuked them. And what did it cause? Conviction. And what did they do? Their mindset of this sin was changed. Their affections and desires of this sin had changed. But they didn't leave the individual in the church. No, because their repentance corresponded with their actions and choices. And so they kicked the sinning individual out. They removed him. So how is it that Paul saw their repentance? Again, we've seen the internal testimony of David in Psalm 51, but how do you see it externally? What were the visible fruits that were experienced in the Corinthians' response? 
We'll just look back at verses 9 through 11. He says, what diligence it produced in you. Diligence, this driving desire and earnest eagerness, a commitment to have the evil that was done corrected. Paul could see it. What clearing of yourselves. They wanted everything that was attached and associated with their sin in this public offense to be cleared and removed. So what does that entail? They confessed this sin. Likely confessed to Paul, likely dealt with in the church. Again, this is a church affirming a sin. So now the whole church is participating in this sin. And so they wanted to clear themselves of this offense through seeking forgiveness. Again, everyone knew of the sin. Now everyone would know of their confession of sin. And we want to pause for a moment to show the importance and significance of biblical confession in the realm of biblical repentance. Because how is it when your mindset has changed and your affections and desires have changed, what does it translate from that to living differently? Clearing the wrong. Confessing sin before God first and foremost, as David did in Psalm 51. But then if you sinned against anybody else, you also confess sin against them. Why? To clear yourself of it, to reconcile And in helping people work through conflicts, working through sin, I have found confession is typically the most difficult for people to do. Not because they're unwilling, they just don't know how. I want to help teach us this morning with a method, not the only method, but it's a method that's been put together by Peacemaking Ministries. It's something I use frequently. It's called the seven A's of confession. I'll list them for you. How do we confess sin to others? Well, first you address everyone involved. Your sin isn't just generally against people, but it's against a specific person or group. And so you know what it's like. We talked about this last week when you're on the other side of being hurt, being sinned against, having that harm done to you. Part of the issue is you don't even know if the person's aware of it. Do they know what they've done to me? Do they know the damage and turmoil they've caused for me and my family? So having the address be to everyone involved communicates, I know what I've done, to you specifically. Number two, avoid if, but, and maybe. What are those statements? They are deflection responses. Blame shifting to a T. It's exactly what Adam did when he fell into sin. But it was the, the wife you gave me, God. They, they remove ownership. If you, you know, what if, did we see that in Psalm 51? Did David say, well, God, if you wouldn't put Bathsheba on that rooftop, I wouldn't have sinned. No, he owned it. He says in Psalm 51, I sinned against you, God, you alone, admitted specifically, taking full ownership of what he's done. Address everyone involved, avoid if, but, and maybe admit specifically what you've done. This is not the time for generalities. Again, you want the person that you've sinned against to know that you're aware of it. And you acknowledge it to try and remove the barriers between your relationship. Number four, you want to acknowledge the hurt. Acknowledge that what you've done is not just sinned against them or hurt them, but you've damaged the relationship. You've done harm to a brother or sister in Christ. And you acknowledge that. Number five, accept the consequences. You know, perhaps more than any other indicator of biblical genuine repentance is somebody who's humble and willing to reconcile, even if it means taking on relational ramifications and consequences for what they've done. Because this gets to the heart of it, does it not? If a person just going through these steps, what are they going to do when it comes to here? They're going to minimize the pain and damage to themselves. They're going to justify it. They're going to rationalize it. And they'll do whatever kinds of manipulation in order to minimize the pain that comes because of their expense. But the person who sees what they've done, they've been humble. Again, they're broken before God. Whatever it takes, however long it takes to rebuild trust, I'm willing to do it. That's the heart. Number six, alter your behavior. You can't do that at first, but you can, in your confession, let them know you never want to do this again. 
I know I've sinned against you in this way. I know that I've hurt you. I know that I've damaged our relationship. I know that it might take some steps for me to rebuild trust. And I'm willing to do that. And by God's grace, I never want to do this ever again to you. And then you ask for forgiveness. Will you forgive me? We'll get to that next week, Lord willing. But you see just a simple progression that you see of communicating a helpful confession of sin because confession of sin matters in repentance because not all confession of sin communicates you're truly sorry for sin. Just because you confess sin doesn't mean you mean it. I'll give you an example of this. A few weeks ago, I I mentioned to you the uh, atrocity that is the opening ceremony of the Olympics. The sacrilege of the Last Supper scene. They came out with an apology a few days later. I'm not sure if you've seen it. I want to read it to you. And let's see if there's a true heart behind this. And I quote, Clearly, there was never an intention to show disrespect to any religious group. On the contrary, I think we really did try to celebrate community tolerance. Looking at the results of the polls that we shared, we believe that this ambition was achieved. If because... People have taken any offense. We are, of course, really, really sorry. Is that a genuine, heartfelt, repentant attitude? Like that had to be written by a man. (laughs) Written by a husband. That's like to a T. I'm sorry that you have feelings. (laughs) And if what I did hurt them. What I did was fine, but it hurt you. So I guess I'm sorry. See, confession of sin matters, especially among fellow believers, because while God can see the repentant sinner's heart, people cannot. So the window into your heart is through the confession of sin, because your words communicate the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So confession of sin is vitally important, and the Corinthians have done this in clearing themselves, not just before Paul, but before all because of the public nature of the sin. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, what indignation this visibly produced among you. Their feelings and their desires have changed. They are now angry about this sin, that they had thought this was okay, that this has maligned the testimony of Christ in his church, so it fuels them towards greater holiness. What fear it produced in them. Fear of God. Fear of God and his standards and his holiness. Fear of sin and how you can even participate in it by a sin of omission and not addressing this sinning individual in the church. What vehement desire, a yearning, longing to see the relationship to Paul restored. Because all rebuke and repentance is with the goal of restoration, reconciliation of the person to their God and for one believer to another. That's the goal of all of this. What zeal it produced. This intense dedication for renewed holiness. What vindication, whatever the punishment is, whatever the penalty, again, they were willing to take it. If it meant further distancing themselves from the sin. Notice what he says last. In all things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. Their lives changed. And it proved the genuineness of their heartfelt repentance. Again, look at David's inner heart testimony of Psalm 51. Look at the Corinthian church's example of their outward manifestations of their inward humility to catch a glimpse of what biblical repentance looks like. And when we see it like this, did we see it in rightful progression in Psalm 51 and in 2 Corinthians 7 that, okay, their their minds have been changed. Now their emotions have been changed. Now their lives have been changed. No, it happens much more organically than that. Think of it like threads of a fabric weaving together to demonstrate their repentance. Thomas Watson says this, Repentance is a spiritual medicine made up of six ingredients. Sight of sin, sorrow for sin, confession of sin, shame for sin, hatred for sin, and turning from sin. 
Ingredient number one, sight of sin, you see it differently. Ingredient number two, a sorrow over a sin, you're grieved by your sin. Confession of sin and ownership of what you've done wrong and admission and clearing of it. Shame for sin, you're burdened by what that has brought upon the name of Christ. Hatred for sin, I never ever want to do this again. And turning from sin, total reorientation inside out. In other words, it's a change of mind, affections, and the will, a change of thinking, feeling, and living. Now, before we close, this is not intended to give you a master checklist to be whipped out and comparing somebody who's harmed you to say, huh, let's see, has their mindset changed? No. Has their feelings changed? Maybe, but it's probably fake. No. Has their lives changed? Yeah, but it's probably fake. It's not meant for you to condemn others. Biblical repentance is first and foremost for you as the Christian. So if this morning, as I've been working through this, that you've had somebody else in your mind like, oh, I'm so glad they're here. I hope they're hearing this. God, thank you. Like you're clearly speaking to them through this. How far you have fallen from last week. How much you can forget in but seven days. Matthew 7, get the log out of your own eye first. Because, church, if you are not first crushed and broken by your own sin, you will be incapable of clearly seeing sin in anyone else. Because your pride has clouded your judgment. And more than anything else, the steps, the progressions, leave all of that behind. You want to know what true biblical repentance looks like? You are broken over your sin. You are crushed under it. You are weeping for what you've done against your God and against your brother or sister in Jesus Christ. Is this what you weep about most in your life? Is this your greatest concern? Is that you have a sensitive conscience that is repentant towards God of any sin? Or is repentance even on your radar each day? Do you weep more for your losses in this world than you weep for your sins? Were you more concerned about your stocks crashing last week than you were concerned about your sins? Are you more concerned about the details of the schedule coming up this week than you're concerned about your sins? Church, understand what Scripture is teaching us here. That so many problems come in the world and come in the church because we are missing the key link of daily repentance in the life of every Christian. We're too busy pointing the finger at everyone else that you are not actually dealing with your own soul before your own God and leave them to him. Perhaps through the sermon this morning, something's come to your mind. Something's been gripping your heart. There's been a pit in your stomach about something you've said or done before God or others. That is conviction of sin that is caused by the spirit of the living God in you this morning. Because that's how God works. God works through the preaching and teaching of his word to confront, to convict with the sword of the spirit, to bring about biblical repentance. Thomas Watson has said this, the word preached is the engine God uses to effect repentance. It is compared to a hammer and to a fire, the one to break, the other to melt the heart. How great a blessing it is to have the word dispensed. And how hard they who put out the lights of heaven will find it to escape hell. Ministers are but the pipes and organs. It is the Holy Spirit breathing in them that makes their words effectual. So understand this morning, church, if there is something that is gripping your heart, your conscience is bothered, do not suppress the Spirit's conviction within. 
Confess this sin before your God. Find freedom, find forgiveness as your mindset has now been changed because clearly there's conviction. You see it differently than when you first came in. There's a desire that's produced within you that did not happen when you first came in. And now you're on the step of responsibility of will you respond in humility and confession or will you suppress it in your pride and explain it away and thus callous and sear your conscience that's doing more damage to yourself and those around you for the rest of your days. If we leave this morning with anything else, let us leave with a sober mindset regarding our sin. That you do not, I do not care about our sin near as much as we should. And even a mere lack of repentance should be a cause of weeping and wailing repentance this morning. A petition of a prayer going to the heaven's throne room. God, forgive me for not caring as much as my sin as you do. Forgive me for being cold and calloused and purely robotic with the Christian life. And renew the spirit within me. If you're here this morning and you've rejected Christ outwardly and you feel the conviction and weight of your sin, do not run from it. Isaiah 55 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, turn away from it, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There is forgiveness offered through the blood of Jesus Christ as he took our sins on himself on that cross. It extends forgiveness and mercy and grace ever and abundantly flowing from it. For those who would come to him, confess their sins, he will forgive them and have mercy on them to the uttermost. But church, again, much of our problems comes because we're not truly broken over our sin as we should be. And so the call this morning is to Do some heart work. Searching within the recesses of your heart and mind. Do you care as much about sin as what the scriptures has reflected? And if not, we need to linger here. Not leave it to the rest of the day. And pray for God to bring it. Lord willing, next week we move from rebuke to repent to forgive, forgiveness. You will not want to miss that one. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, we are humbled by the word of truth this morning. God, we do not see our sin near as significant enough. Forgive us for so casually approaching sin in this life abusing the grace that you've given us through the gospel. Father, I pray that you would stir up within us a heart of humility before you that doesn't look to point the finger at everyone else, but that doesn't have any time to look outward because it's so consumed with the inner heart. Father God, would you produce this gospel humility in us and through us by your Spirit, Would you change our thinking, change our desires and affections, and change our lives by the word of truth through biblical repentance? For those who are ensnared in sin, I pray that you'd lead them towards repentance. That you would cause them to see differently and feel differently and thus live differently before you as the fruits of what you have done through your spirit within them. Father in heaven, we are dependent on your spirit for this. We need you to work in us. And we cast ourselves before your throne, asking you to give an increase to the word of truth this morning. That souls might be saved. That sin might be confessed. That we would turn from it and run towards you in holiness. We ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.